burdens we have increasingly having as a word for our time is that we need a new generation of leaders in our churches. When we read the scriptures, we read that God made Joseph begin his ministry at the age of 30, David to begin his ministry at the age of 30 as king of Israel, Jesus to begin his ministry at the age of 30. And as was the custom among Jewish rabbis, they would never choose as their disciples people who were older than them. So if Jesus was 30, Peter was probably 29, John was probably 27. Think of that, some of you who are 27 and 29 years old here. And um, all the disciples were below 30. Three and a half years later, on the day of Pentecost, the oldest apostle was 33. The youngest apostle was around 30. That is how the church was launched. And what a fantastic work they did because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. When we started the church in my home, I was 35. Brother Ian was 34. Many of our elder brothers who are leading the churches in Tamil Nadu and elsewhere were in their 30s when they started as elders in their church. Why is it we don't have people in their early 30s now coming forth to lead churches, to preach the word? Is it because the elder brothers don't allow them to grow up? Is it because some elder brother like King Saul sits on his throne hindering young anointed David from coming up? We don't want to be like Saul. We want to be like Paul who trained Timothy and who said, Timothy, the things that I committed to you, you go forth and commit to other men who will be able to teach others also. The older generation is getting older and leaders are not trained in one day or one year. It took about 10 years, 13 years for people like Joseph and David to be trained to leadership. So we got to start early. But the time has come when younger gener the younger generation needs to take the lead in ministering the word, in being shepherds, evangelists, teachers. And I want to encourage all older, elder brothers here, please don't be like King Saul. Encourage others where you see an anointing. Encourage them to come forth. We desperately need that in India. We older brothers are not going to live forever. And unless we encourage the younger ones, they will not be able to come forth. So wherever you see in your churches, we're always keeping eye, our eyes open for that everywhere. Younger brothers with an anointing, with a gift, remember God has given it to them. Encourage them, push them forward and step back. That's what I want to do. The need is so great. And we need to encourage them. That's why we wanted to gear this meeting and tomorrow's second meeting towards that type of leadership to come forth, to encourage people to be anointed. It's not something new. This is how we started 33 years ago. There was not one gray hair on the head of people on the day of Pentecost when there were leadership there. And so this is what we want to do more and more in our churches. And we pray that that will be fulfilled in the days to come. So. I have asked a young brother to take the meeting today and tomorrow evening. That is Brother Sandeep Poonan. Um, we heard in the previous session about Jesus, how he learned the Bible from 
his mother Mary, and he probably learned it from the, the rabbis in the synagogue, and um, all of us are the same way. We learned about uh, the gospel, we've learned about the word of God from other people. I, for myself, also am keenly aware that I am a product of many people sitting here. People, my parents, Sunday school teachers, elders of other churches who spoke the Word of God when they came for conferences. I enjoyed listening, listening to them as a child, even as a child, because they made the words of Jesus plain to me. So I stand here a product of so many people here, if not all of you, some through words, some through prayers, and I covet all of them, and I'm humbled by that, that I am able to give back to a certain extent, but I also understand that I minister a lot to people my age and those younger than me, and I want to be an example to them primarily. The, the need of the hour, the, the, we are in the last minutes, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about was what kind of Christian am I? What kind of Christian am I is something that I think has been people are talking about in this conference as well. Everybody wants to know, <clears throat> what kind of Christian are we? Clearly, there are lots of different kinds of Christians that are around. Some Christians, some people call themselves Christians and are truly lovers of Jesus. There are other kinds of Christians whose lives do not display what they claim to believe. There are some Christians who do not believe in the Word of God. What kind of Christian am I? The word Christian itself was started in the first century. It was started in Acts chapter 11 verse 26, where it says that for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians there. And the Christians there were intentional. The Christians there were passionate. The Christians there were persecuted. The Christians there died for their faith. But there was, no, there was no question about them. They were for Jesus. They belonged to the country of Christ. They were little Christs. Those, those were the people who called themselves Christians first in the, in, in the book of Acts. But things have changed so far, 2,000 years later, that the word Christian is not what it meant back then. It meant something real back then, but it doesn't mean that now anymore. I went to the dictionary to look for what was the meaning of Christian there. And it said, one who professes to be, to, professes belief in the teachings of Jesus Christ. That's it. If I have to just profess the the, teach, the belief in the teachings of Jesus Christ, I think there are a lot of Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims who I've met who would be willing to fit this definition of Christian. And that's the definition of Christianity that is commonly understood even in the dictionary. So that was my question to me, what am I, what kind of Christian am I? And a lot of the preaching that we get from this pulpit is trying to tell us what the real kind of Christian there is. So one of the things that I was thinking about was how could I define myself as a Christian? And I don't want to, I don't want to take away from what other people have said because I believe, you know, what we heard yesterday, if we do not have a passion and I think we've heard it throughout the, the yesterday and today, if we do not have a passion for Jesus and a passion to be like Jesus, I don't know what salve, I don't know what ointment to give. Because for me, I feel that is the only way for the Christian worldview, the Christian religion, the Bible to make sense is if Jesus is my passion, and being like Jesus is my passion. There's just no other way for me as far as I'm concerned. So we heard that yesterday morning in the first session. If some of us are struggling in that point, that is the starting point. That must be the starting point for us, for the Christian religion, to make sense. That Jesus is my passion, and becoming like Jesus is my passion. 
And I thought of one word that could describe what Jesus is. Because there are many kinds of Jesuses around. Many kinds of Jesuses that are being preached, even from the pulpits. And I thought of this word, and I thought I'd make up a new word. Because there wasn't a word for that. And I took it from how you define certain people. There's a word called revolutionary. A revolutionary is one whose life is defined by a revolution. A missionary, we know that word. A missionary is one who's defined by a particular mission. The mission to spread the word of Jesus. Something else, it doesn't matter what it is. That's what a missionary is. And I thought that I would define myself as a Christian as a resurrectionary. A resurrectionary is one whose life is defined by the resurrection. One whose life tends to and he, he takes care of and she promotes the resurrection. That is what a resurrectionary is. And I wanted to ask all of you if that would, could become our standard by which we define whether we were Christians or not. Lives that are defined by the resurrection of Jesus. And I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about the resurrection of Jesus and what it means for our lives. So that when we say we are Christians who are resurrectionaries, we know what that means. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 9. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life, so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Here it is. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. This is the basis of my definition. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. As an active soldier fights, I fight to remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Like an athlete competes every day to win a crown or a gold medal, I compete and I contend to remember that Jesus Christ risen from the dead. And like a hard-working farmer tills the soil and prepares a fertile soil, I prepare my heart for Jesus Christ risen from the dead. This is the gospel that Paul was imprisoned and treated like a criminal. This was the gospel that the apostles in Acts chapter 4, it says, the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders imprisoned him because he, they preached Jesus risen from the dead. This is not Jesus a good man. This is not Jesus a man whose philosophy is beautiful to follow. This is not Jesus risen from a nap. This is not Jesus risen from a long sleep. This is not Jesus who used to be such a bad man is now such a good man. This is not the Jesus who can make you such a bad person into a good person. This is Jesus risen from the dead. This is not Jesus who was pretending to be dead and then suddenly became alive. This is not Jesus who was dead for just five minutes. This was Jesus who was dead, fully dead, completely dead, all dead, three days dead so that the body started to stink, but he arose. This is the Jesus who we ought to remember, risen from the dead. What does that mean for our lives? I want to spend the rest of our time talking about two points. Two points that should, be, that should define us as resurrectionaries. People who cling on to the resurrection of Jesus. This is point number one. Christians who are defined by the resurrection must understand that before the resurrection there must be a death. There's no, way I, there's no need for me to raise anybody sitting here because we are not dead. 
The only place for resurrection is when there is death first. And before we talk about death in our own lives, some of us need to start with the death of Jesus. For me, everything begins at the cross. If I feel like I've loved my love, I've lost my love for Jesus that I once had, I go back to the cross. If I don't feel like I'm loved anymore, I go back to the cross. If I ever feel like my Christianity is not making sense anymore, I go back to the cross. Because the cross is where, no, not my cross that I take, the cross of Jesus is where I start my relationship with him. And the cross tells me that there's forgiveness, and that's a beautiful thing for some of us to accept. But a lot of us sitting here probably may have already understood that we get forgiveness of the cross, but we've got to also understand that the cross embodies justice as much as it embodies forgiveness. Which means God doesn't wink at my sins. God doesn't just turn away from my sins. He's bothered by it. In fact, he's offended by it. That's what the cross tells me. So the cross tells me there's forgiveness, but he also says there was justice that needed to be done. That's why I sent my son. That's why I had to crucify my son. Because of justice. And when I come to the cross and I treat, if I treat sin flippantly, that means, and if I see sin, sin, treat sin casually, it means I need to go back to the cross. Not take up my cross, I need to go to the cross of Jesus first. Sit at the foot of the cross of Jesus and understand that there's more, both forgiveness and justice. And I go to the cross of Jesus to understand that there's both the concept of evil and the concept of love. So I don't look around at the world at me and I see all the evil and think that this is just, I believe, in a fatalistic God who just allows things to happen without any control. I understand that there's a God who loves me. You can look at it and see it as evil, the cross, or you can look at it and see it as love. And we sit at the cross and we look at the cross and we understand the meaning of the cross because we see Jesus and we see what God did for us. We see the evil of man and we see the love of God. We see the forgiveness of God and the justice of God all wrapped up in the cross. And it's after I see that cross and I see God and the truth he's trying to tell us through the cross of Christ that I can then say, okay, now I need to have that same death. And we heard about that yesterday as well. Before there is any new life, there must be a death. There's no point us trying to live the Christian life if we are not willing to die. Not take a nap. Not be in a coma for a while. That's not what Jesus... Don't remember Jesus risen from a coma. Don't re remember Jesus who let his passions go for a few months. No, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. There is no resurrection if there is not a death first. And we heard this verse yesterday, yesterday, John 12, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. It's so simple. It's so simple, the truth that Jesus is saying here. If you hold a seed in your hand and you pray over it and you water it and you show it to the sun, it's not going to grow. I can hold the seeds of all these fancy plants and I can hold it in my hands and I can expose it to the, to the sun and I can water it and I can treat it with so much love and concern. But unless it grows into the ground and dies, it will not bear any fruit. It's very simple what Jesus is saying. And I can hear the word of God that comes to me. I can hold it up. I can put it on my scooter. I can put it in my home. I can plaster it all over my home. I can memorize it. I can quote scripture. But if it doesn't go into the soil of, into the soil of my heart and, and find death, there will be no life. And a lot of us, I'm talking mostly to us people who have grown up in the church, those of us who have heard verses for a few years, we hear so many scriptures, but it doesn't go into the soil. We put it in our hands, we quote it in the Sunday school meetings, we come up and testify using those verses, but it never bears fruit because it doesn't go into our heart and die. And it's not complicated 
The problem, the complication comes because we don't want to put it in the ground. We love looking at it. We love quoting it. We love new translations of it. We love reading the Bible. We love hearing sermons on it. But the one thing we refuse to do is to take that verse and allow it to cause us to die. And Jesus says, there's no chance of growth unless the seed falls to the ground and dies. There are nine millions of options that, are, that you can do with a seed except death. But there is only one option that creates life. Let's put, in, put it in the soil and let it die. Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. That's the cross for me. I have been crucified with Christ. Mark chapter 8 verse 34 and 35. If anyone wishes to come up to me, take, deny yourself Take up your cross, follow me. Look, these are verses we've all known. These are none of these verses are new verses. But there is no life without death first. The whole point of why we are Christians is because we believe in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was would be life would have been meaningless on this earth if he had not died for us. There had to be a death first. Whoever loses his life for my sake says, my life is over. And I read something about George Mueller. I don't know if if all of you know George Mueller. George Mueller was a person who who lived in England, and he um, took care of many orphans. They say he took care of 10,000 orphans. He raised a lot of money. Crores and crores of rupees without asking for a single penny directly from anybody. He didn't send out prayer letters. Back in his day, he didn't do it. But he took care of 10,000 orphans. And when he was 90-something year old, they asked him, what is the secret of his ministry? And this is what George Mueller said. There was a day when I died, utterly died. And the day he was talking about was a day back in his 20s. There was a day back in my 20s, George Mueller said, when I died, utterly died. And as he spoke, he bent lower and lower until he touched the floor. And this is what he died to. He died to George Mueller. He died to George Mueller's opinions, George Mueller's preferences, his tastes, his will. Died to the world. Died to the world's approval. Died to the world's censure or criticism. Died to the approval or blame of even my brethren or my friends. He died back when he was 29, I think. He said, there was a day when I died, and since then I have studied only to show myself approved to God. A lot of us would love to have George Mueller's ministry. A lot of us would love to take care of orphans. A lot of us would love to be something in the body of Jesus. But if you asked him who did something magnificent for Jesus, what is the secret of your ministry? He said, back when I was 29, I decided to die. Die to my preferences. Die to my will. Die to my opinions. Die to my tastes and my wills. Die to the world. The world's culture. Whatever the world tells you is hip. Whatever the world tells you is cool. Die to it. There's no other way for life to come until that death happens. We can try all kinds of things. We can sanitize our lives. We can take frequent baths spiritually, thinking that will get us clean, but it won't create growth. It won't create life. The only way is to die. Die to what the world thinks of us. Die to what even what our brothers and our friends think of us, whether they criticize us, whether they blame us. And I have only one thing, to study, to show myself approved unto God. There is no life without death. And I think there's a lot to say about dying to myself, and we've heard it very strongly in the church. But I want you to notice that George Mueller's life was not only about death to self. He didn't say the secret of my life is to be dead to myself. That's part of what he said. And I fear that in a teaching that says there is no life without death, that we spend our whole lives being about death, that we don't understand that there's another part to it. 
The gospel is incomplete if it's only about death. George Mueller, and I show you this in scripture as well, also said this one last line that I wanted to show you. I study to show myself approved unto God. We have to take our minds and saying we've got to do two things. I've got to die to myself saying I've got to get rid of everything that I want to do, but I'm going to do something else. I'm not just going to be there and say, God, do what you want with me. That's part of the answer. But then I do actively do something else. And for many years, I spent my years trying to die to self, die to self without doing something proactively towards God. I never sought to be approved by God. I thought, oh, all I got to do is die to self. No, dying to self is part of it. But as you die to self, seek to be approved by God. And I fear that some of us don't see the way God, Jesus was approved by God. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. And the way Jesus was approved by God and vindicated by God was not by the fact that he died for our sins. Jesus was vindicated by God by the fact that God raised him up and seated him in the heavenlies. So Lord, let's not think that our own spirituality and Jesus' own spiritually, spirituality ended on the cross. It didn't. It didn't end on the cross. Jesus' spirituality ended when God raised him up and seated him in the heavenlies. And I fear that a lot of us don't complete the sentence. Most, a lot of us don't complete the sentence. We only talk about dying to self, dying on the cross. We only talk about Jesus' cross. We only talk about Jesus' death, but we don't talk about the resurrection. And I, f- I fear that a lot of us Christians are living in Saturday. Let me explain what I mean by Saturday. Jesus died on a Thursday. Even though the culture says he died on a Friday, he died on a Thursday. He was dead for three days and three nights. And a lot of us sit at the cross and we look at Jesus and we say, Jesus, you died on the cross. I'm so thankful for you. Jesus, I know that your message to me is take up your cross and I will take up your cross. But we're stuck on Saturday. We're stuck in this theology of the Saturday after Jesus died. Where we remember his death, where we mourn his death, where we say, Jesus, I want to take up your cross and follow you. I want to deny myself and follow you. And we keep getting stuck on Saturday. And every new day that comes, it's Saturday all over again. But Sunday came. And Sunday was the resolution. And Sunday was the vindication of all the 33 plus years of Jesus' life. It's the risen Jesus that is the vindication of our lives. It is not Jesus on the cross. And the culture, even the Christian culture, magnifies the manger and Christmas. And even the the culture magnifies to a certain extent the cross. But I think we've got it backwards. Far more than we magnify the manger, far more than we magnify the cross, we have to magnify in our own lives and in the life of Jesus the empty tomb. We have to understand there, Jesus is not on the cross anymore. Jesus is an, and we have hope because of the resurrection. There is no hope if there is no resurrection. There must be death. There is no way to create life without it. But there is no hope if there is no resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. Paul says it as clearly as anybody can. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. And we live in our sins and we think this is the way God meant it to be. No, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins because you have not embraced that Jesus has been raised. It's an incomplete gospel. It is a tragedy if we concentrate on dying to self, but at the same time we are not gripped and excited about the resurrection of Jesus in our lives. 
It's no different from any other Eastern religion. It's no different from all the other religions out there that says, in today's culture too, it's becoming very popular. Empty your mind. Meditate. Spend time in quiet and meditate and empty your mind. Reject all kinds of desire because desire is bad. Karma is everything because what you do in the past is going to affect you in the future. That's all could be, all could be consumed even in our Christianity where we spend our time just looking at Jesus on the cross and dying to self saying, i got to get rid of that desire. I've got to get rid of that desire. Christianity is different. Christianity is different and we have hope because Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus rose again. There And there is no hope for our own lives if we do not experience resurrection. Some of us might be experiencing death. Some of us might have experienced the death to self in our own lives. But we'll be miserable as we've heard you. We'll be discontent. We'll be legalistic if we don't at the same time also experience resurrection. Let me show you a couple of verses for that. 2 Timothy 2.11, that same passage where we talked about being an athlete and being a soldier. Just a couple of verses down, it says it's a trustworthy statement. If we died with him, if you take up your cross, if you get onto the cross I have been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. If that has happened, we will also live with him. Why aren't we living with him then? Why is there no life in there? Have, has the devil robbed us and said, finish the sentence halfway through? And a lot of us, you know, we talked about that verse in Philippians where some people are just working it out and some people are just working it in. We're not completed the sentence. It's the same way. Some of us are so busy dying to self We've not taken any time to understand that we must also live with him. Philippians 3.10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. The power, the power of his resurrection, that's the whole point. Forgetting what leaves behind, I only do one thing, to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Along with the fellowship of his suffering. Power of his resurrection goes hand in hand with the death. I hope we don't lose sight of resurrection and all the death that we have to go through. And you heard me say, there is no life without death. So we ought to die, but we've got to understand that there's a life of Jesus that must grip us all the same. Galatians 2.20, I read the first part of the verse. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but somebody else is living. Have we crucified ourselves and nobody living in our lives? That we're just empty people? There's just no two ways about it. If we put ourselves on the cross and nobody comes in, if Jesus doesn't come in, guaranteed we'll come back to life. The only way that we stay dead is if Jesus lives in me. And the life which I now live in flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave, me, gave himself up for me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. These are all verses we all know. We probably all memorize. We don't even need to read our Bibles to know these verses. We beg you on behalf of God. Be reconciled to God. This is what it means to be reconciled with God. Reconciled. Reconciled. That's an accounting word to reconcile the left hand and the right hand. Reconcile that everything you spent money for, you got something in return. That's the basis of business. If you, get, if you give something and you give your money, you have to get something in return. And Paul is saying, I beg you, have that accounting reconciliation. Make sure in your own life that there was a reconciliation that's going on. What is the reconciliation? Here it is. He made Jesus, who knew no sin, sinless all his life, to become sin on our behalf. Left-hand side of the accounting, right-hand side is so that we may become the righteousness of God in him. We, Jesus just didn't die on the cross and become sin on our behalf. He says there's a reconciliation. The weighing, the weighing balance is only on the left-hand side if you embrace that. The right-hand side of the, of the balance has to be taken care of. We ought to become the righteousness of God in Him. 
We, we heard in the morning session about laboring for Christ to be formed in me. Christ in me. The one mark of a resurrectionary. The one mark of a resurrectionary. In him. In Jesus is the mark of a resurrectionary. I stop living for myself, but I live for Jesus. And I live not only for Jesus, I live in Jesus. I live in him. I throw away, I die to all my desires, I die to all my ambitions, and I don't just live like a blank slate, I live in him. Like a plant, like a branch lives in the plant. It doesn't get any more complicated than that. We have to reduce our spirituality to saying, I'm going to throw out my ambitions, my preferences, my approval from man, but I am going to live in him. And a lot of us young people don't have confidence. A lot of us young people are so scared of, of being rebuked and different things like that because we have not found our place in him. We stand before, G we stand before God in Jesus, not separately. Every morning I must make a, a conscious effort. I must make a conscious effort to crawl, so to speak, to crawl into Jesus. Because I find many times when I go to sleep and when I wake up, I find myself like a branch that has crawled out of the tree. I don't know what happened, but sometimes when I wake up, I find myself having my own ambitions once again, my own desires. I went to bed saying, God, I want to be in you. But it may be 10 minutes after I wake up, I'm back by myself. And then the law of God becomes like a stick that keeps beating me up, saying, you know you shouldn't be doing that. You know you shouldn't be doing that. That's not the solution to stop doing that. Crawl back into him. Crawl back into him saying, God, you died for me so that I can live in you. Not with you alone, in you. And the life that I now live is the life of Jesus, not me anymore. And so, of course, if I'm living in him, I am consumed by grace. I understand grace so easily because I understand it's not me who's doing that good thing. I'm in him. So Christ is giving me the power to do it. And the spirit of discipline that God gives us maybe is just mostly a spirit of discipline that says keep crawling back into Jesus. Into part of being the body. How do we get a burden for building the body of Jesus? By crawling back in the body of Jesus. Crawling into the body of Jesus and saying, God, this is your body. Who else is in here with me? And there's a person sitting to the left who's broken, but is in the body of Jesus because he loves Jesus. He accepts Jesus over him as his head. He's in the body, and we fellowship with other people in the body of Jesus. And I saw this to be such a revelation for me from Ephesians chapter 1. If you think Paul was not gripped with one thing, which is being in Jesus, read Ephesians 1. So many times Paul talks about being in him. Verse 1, those who are faithful, he's writing to the Ephesians, for those who are faithful in Christ Jesus, not for faithful to Christ Jesus. Not people who are doing a lot of good things that Jesus would approve of. People who are faithful to be in Jesus. Verse 3, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, not sitting next to Christ. Not doing our own thing in heaven. No sitting in Christ. That's where all our spiritual blessings. Why are we so discouraged? Because we're not crawling back into Jesus. We think we have to stand next to God and Jesus is our advocate alone. He is. But he's advocate in him. He is our righteousness. He is our best advocate because we are in him. 
We are a part of him. And it is out of that that Jesus and the Holy Spirit groans and says, This, I am, he's in me. Verse 4, just as he chose us, this is all Ephesians chapter 1. We've already in verse 4 and we've got three in hymns. Just as he chose us in him. Oh, I love that theology that I'm a beautiful person, special for God. And that is true. But he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us. He gave you so much in the beloved. In Jesus, in Jesus, you're getting so much stuff. And we come to God and we say, God, you need to help me. I've got problems. God's word to you is very simple. Get in Jesus. Not stand near Jesus. Get in him. Understand his grace. Throw away all your desires to be big and famous and to have all these career ambitions. Throw them all away. There must be a death first. And don't be ambitionless ambition less don't be without ambition don't be without any things get the ambitions of Jesus get the passions of Jesus and you get that by crawling over and over back into him and saying God I'm part of the body of Jesus he'll give you ambitions he'll give you gifts because you're in him it's his gifts not your gifts verse 7 we're up to number five with five in him so far in him we have redemption I love that. I, I, I love the fact that I realize here that it's only not by his blood, but in him, through his blood. I get redemption. Not just salvation from going to hell. In him, I get redemption from my sins. You want freedom from sin? You want victory over sin? In him, redemption through the blood. Verse 8, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him. In Jesus, God's planned some incredible things for all of us in Jesus. And all of us want our own ministry. All of us want our own thing that we do that's special for Jesus. And God says, get into me, get into Jesus, and you'll do amazing things for me. But as long as you want to be separate, as long as you want to have your own ministry, there's very little that you can do. In fact, there's nothing you can do without me, we heard yesterday. Nothing. Get into me. You have problems finding out God's will? Simple answer. You want to know the mystery of God's will to you? He's purposed a will for you. But it's in him. He's purposed it in him. When we get into Jesus and we say, God, I'm done with all my own ambitions, my own thoughts, my own preferences. When I'm in him, I find out his will for me. I don't get conformed to the world, but I renew my mind and I find out the will of God. I renew my mind to be in him. Verse 10, the summing up of all things in Christ. Everything, everything, things in the heaven and things on the earth. Everything adds up to Christ and in Christ. Everything, whether you like it or not, is going to add up to in Christ. Not Christ plus whatever you will do for him. It's going to be all summed up in Christ. Oh, why don't we quit trying to do something for God, trying to think that we're not good enough for God, and get in him. We're all going to add up to Christ. Whatever we do, it'll all be part of in Christ. It's not going to be anything separate that we do. Verse 10 and through 12, it starts out by saying, In him also we have an inheritance. We've got all kinds of gifts that are available to us. Verse 13 and fold, you're sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So many of us young people want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So many of us young people want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And we're never sure if we are. There is one way to be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise is to be in him. Where we heard John 16, 14, the Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus. The Holy Spirit will exalt Jesus. The Holy Spirit will exalt him so that every day more and more I want to be in him. Not him next to me. Not him helping me. Not him doing a lot of good things for me. No, he wants me to be in him. And we've made the Christianity to be so many things but in him. We also want him to be with him. 
And that's not, for me, I've seen that that's not good enough. Jesus wants to be with me, and that I understand that concept. But I understand from when I say God is with me, there's the possibility for me to do my own thing and God come along with me. Can I do this? Can I do that? Is this according to your will, God? Can you come with me through that? And it, it works to a point. But for me, I find so much more liberty, so much more freedom, so much more rest. When I say, God, all I want to be is in you. Not for you to be with me. Look, I'm not, I'm not knocking it. I'm not saying that's a bad thing to be with. Jesus is going to be with us. He said he will be with us. I'm just trying to say there is a more exalted calling as we get to be with Jesus. Jesus says, come and be a part of me. If you love me so much, if you love hanging out with me so much, I've got something even better for you. I want you to be in me. A very part of my own body. We don't strain with gifts that we have. We get into Jesus and we say, God, you, let me use your gifts. Let me recap. Point number one. Before the resurrection, there must be a death. I've talked a lot about the resurrection but I started with the death because a lot of us mustn't forget that we ought to die. Jesus died, we die too. And we take up our cross and we deny ourselves and we die. And we don't die just to what we may think our own preferences. A lot of us have to die to the approval of man. Some of us have to die to the approval of the people in the church. But we must finish the sentence. Let not this life be only about death to self. Let it be about being approved to God. Let it be about a resurrection. If you are going to die with Jesus, you are in good company. Because Jesus led the way. But... You will be morbid and you'll be discouraged and you'll be beat up if you don't complete the sentence. If you don't also live with him and not only with him, but in him. In him. God wants us to build a body in the last days, in the last hour. It says that God is preparing a body. He wants that body to be perfect. If we, want to be, if we want this Christian life to make sense, if we want the commandments of God to be easy and his yoke to be easy and his burden to be light, if we want that, this is the only way. Complete death to us and complete life in him. And when I'm feeling discouraged and when I'm feeling down and then when I'm feeling beat up about the lusts in my body that seem to be beating me up, start at the cross of Jesus. Understand the justice that God expects. Understand the death that has to come into our own passions and into our own lives. But complete the sentence, young people, especially complete the sentence and say, I'm going to live in him. That is a life that is freeing. That is a life that will give you joy. That is a life that will allow you for the, for the yoke of Jesus to be easy and his burden to be light is when I say, God, not only am I going to die, I'm going to live with you and in you. And I'm going to complete the transaction. I'm not only going to be, I'm going to reconcile the equation. I'm going to reconcile the equation that you took my sin that you became sin for me, I'm going to reconcile by being in you. Not by doing all these things for you, not by cleaning up my act, not like getting my things all in order and then saying, God, I'm ready for you to use me. No, by crawling today into Jesus. And every day I need to wake up in the morning and say, God, I want to crawl back into you. And two hours later, you're at work and your boss is getting on your case and is on your last nerve. And you say, God, give me strength to crawl back into you. That is the beginning point of all victory over sin is crawling into Jesus. 
Paul's life was laboring for Christ to be formed in you. Be reconciled with God in him. One day we will go to heaven and we will be completely like him. We will be him in him. As, we, as I said in the beginning, if we don't have a passion for Jesus and to be like Jesus and we don't have a passion to be in Jesus, I don't know what to say. I don't know what alternate salve to, op- to offer you that will make sense with the Bible. I just don't. I haven't found it. But I do, I have found through the lives of people who walked before me sitting here and through a little bit in my own life that there is one life where the burdens of Jesus will be light and the yoke of Jesus is easy. And that's when I'm in him. Young people, learn from my mistakes. Learn from mistakes of other people who preach or who say, don't make this life about being legalistic and beat up. Don't do all this stuff. Be in him. Let's pray. Father, you are a good God. We love you. Lord, I pray that you may open our eyes to see Jesus. Not Jesus born in a manger, not Jesus hanging on the cross, but the empty tomb Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father. Lord, I pray that that risen, resurrected, exalted, glorified Jesus would be what enthralls us, what captivates us. Not this man who felt so sorry for me and died for me, but much more than that, Lord. The person who died and God was able to rise again. Lord, I, we pray that we may help us to always remember to be in you, to crawl back in you, to get back in you every day. That we may give up all of our desires, all of our passions, all of our biases, all of our preferences, all of our ideas of what we think would be a successful life. All the ideas that we think that would allow us to make it in this life and that we would make it about being in you. That we may, be, we may find our joy in you. That we may find our hope in you. That we may find our faith in you. That we may find goodness in you. That we may find our gifts in you. Help us to this end, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I certainly believe that was a word for our time and for our, ourselves because I don't know whether you have ever heard a message about being in Christ. We hear a lot of preaching, receive Christ into you. And that's also scripture, Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ, now Christ lives in me. Colossians 1.27 Christ in you, the hope of glory. But you go to Ephesians, and it's all about you in Christ. I look at it like the two parts of my body, left, right. Christ in me, me in Christ. And if we keep on emphasizing Christ in us, it's right. But it's like a bodybuilder who has built up the left side of his body very powerful and the right side is all skinny and like a skeleton. It's pretty ugly. So we need to work on now the right side. I found through the years that in all of Christendom, the biggest problem is imbalance. We get get taken up with one truth and that becomes everything and we build up the left side of the body. And very often that's what takes us off track, you know. Or to use another illustration, if you're riding your scooter or car on a road and you've turned the wheel so much, or Christendom uh, in general has turned the wheel so much to the right that we are completely off the main road and we've gone into the ditch here and we know the reason was they turned the wheel and never turned it back. And so we say, we got to set it right, and we turn the wheel to the left side and go zooming past and cross the road and go to the other side. We're keeping still, we got to emphasize uh, not what Christendom is emphasizing, to the left, to the left. We follow the cliff the other side. Christ in us, we are to be in Christ. The death of Christ, certainly the Bible speaks about that. And the other, the resurrection of Christ. 
Are these opposites? No, two parts of one truth. But there can be a death without a resurrection. The world is full of people who die without a resurrection. But there can be no resurrection without a death. So when you speak about death, there may not be a resurrection. But when you speak about resurrection, the death is there automatically. And that's why if you read in the Acts of the Apostles, I don't have time to show you that. But in the Acts of the Apostles, never did the Apostles say, we are witnesses of his crucifixion. We are witnesses of his resurrection. I'll show you one instance of that in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. You know, when Judas Iscariot had died, hung himself, and they came together, 120 of them in Acts 1.15, and Peter says, you know, out of the 12 whom Jesus chose, one is already dead. He fell and killed himself. Now, therefore, verse 21, it's necessary that among all of those who accompanied the Lord Jesus from the time of the baptism, one of these, verse 22, must become with us a witness, not of the fact that he died on the cross, a witness of his resurrection. Now I want you to take a concordance sometime. Those of you who are serious about knowing the truth of God, and look up the word resurrection in the Acts of the Apostles, and you'll see it comes so many times. Paul saying, I'm a witness for the resurrection. I'm living for the hope of the resurrection from the dead. And Christendom has not emphasized that sufficiently. We think we are spiritual because we are dying. If you read Hindu scriptures and the teachings of Hinduism, you get the Hindu newspaper. Every day in that paper, in the center page, there's this little section on what Hinduism teaches. I read it many times just to see what they teach. And very often, it is about self-denial, giving up your desires, denying yourself and forsaking the world and dying to these desires. It sounds very much like some things I hear some of us preach in the church. But you'll never read a word there about resurrection. That's missing. It's death, 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 death. They're just like some uh, preachers who preach about death in our churches. And that's why they're so gloomy, so miserable. They can't get along with others because they're playing dead. The proof that you've really died is God raises you up in Christ into another life. It's not that I have died to myself. It is that Christ lives in me. Now I'm in Christ now. And when you're in Christ, you will automatically understand the value of the body of Christ because that's what it means to be in him. I can't be in Christ and not be in his body. I'm not just in his head. I'm in Christ means I'm in his body. And I see so many Christians today who don't value the local body of Jesus Christ. They are interested in evangelism, reaching out here, reaching out there. I tell you, they've missed it. You have missed something. I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to young people to miss it. And I know it comes by revelation. These truths that you heard come by revelation. It's not that somebody can sit and teach you. If you are passionate after God, he will show you the things that Human eyes have not seen, human ears have not heard, and that has not even entered into the mind of man. It all depends on your personal passion for Christ. If you're just a meeting attender, coming and listening to what others preach, you're going to miss it. But if you have a personal passion for Christ, you will see it, what it means to be in Christ. I believe the greatest need in India and the world is to demonstrate by our life that Jesus Christ is alive. You know, I've looked at it like this. Supposing I were to witness to a Hindu or a Muslim and tell him, you know that your sins can all be forgiven. Jesus died for you. The man says, I'm desperate. Tell me, what is the gospel? And I, and I tell him, you know, Jesus died for you. He died on the cross. He died. Your sins can be forgiven. Believe in him. He, all your sins were put upon him. He died for you. What your filthy things, all the million filthy things you did in your life. He took it. He died for you. Oh, he says, thank you. But tell me one more thing, he says, says me. Can this Jesus, who you talk about, also give me victory over my anger? I shout at my wife quite often. Will he help me there? What is your experience? And I say, no, he can't help you there, but he'll forgive you. What about this lusting? I find I'm always lusting and going to the internet for pornography. Uh, will this Jesus help me there? 
and you say from your experience, no, he can't help you there, but he can forgive you. After you watch the pornography, he'll forgive you. Is this the gospel? Or we say, what about this competitive spirit? I love money so much. I'm always pursuing after more and more money. Can Jesus help me there? No, he can't help you there. I also do it, but uh, he'll forgive you. This is the result of there's no resurrection. Jesus is not alive. He died and he's gone. He can't help me today. He died and he died and he's, he'll forgive all my sin. But what about helping me today? There's no resurrection. This is the Jesus being pre preached in Christendom today. It is another Jesus who did not rise from the dead. And this is the work of the devil. See all the famous pictures of Jesus around the world that you have seen. Always it is a helpless Jesus. A helpless baby lying in a manger who can't do anything. Or a helpless man hanging on the cross who can't do anything. Or some of these sacred heart pictures who look like a woman. I will bless all those who put this picture in there in my house. Have you ever seen a picture of Jesus coming out of the grave? Alive, triumphant from the dead. That is so rare. You see it in the Bible story books for children. Where do you see a, a painting of that prominently? No. The devil doesn't want people to see that. He always wants to think of them. Jesus in a manger. Jesus hanging on a cross. Or Jesus in the sacred heart. All this helpless type of Jesus. Not the powerful, triumphant Jesus who overcame sin, who overcame the devil, who can overcome your internet pornography, who can overcome your anger, overcome your jealousy, who can slay every giant of Canaan in your body. That's why the resurrection is so important. My dear brothers and sisters, what we have missed is an emphasis on the resurrection. It will change your life. It changed mine when I began to see how important the resurrection of Jesus was in the preaching of the apostles. And we preach so much about death. The death of Jesus and death to myself and death to myself and death to myself. What about the resurrection? Please hear the word of the Lord. It's power before God. Heavenly Father, open our eyes to the things that the devil has blinded us to. That we may see that your Holy Spirit work, not just in this moment, but in the coming days. Open our eyes. Continue to speak to us through your prophetic word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.